The inline four-cylinder engine is probably the most plentiful engine configuration in the world. It outnumbers all the other engine configurations because it offers an ideal balance, an ideal blend of power potential, efficiency, smoothness, and compactness. And you can find it in thousands upon thousands of different cars, motorcycles, boats, trucks, you name it. The inline four is in everything. Actually, just walk down the city street of any place in the world and chances are very, very slim that there isn't an inline four engine somewhere very near you. And if you took any of those countless inline four engines out there and opened it up, inside it you would find a crankshaft that looks like this. In fact, at the heart of every inline four out there is the same crankshaft. There might be differences in materials used and the number of counterweights and other slight variations, but in fact, all production inline fours out there have the same crankshaft. Well, yes, all of them except one. The inline four inside the Yamaha R1 sports bike has a completely different crankshaft from all the other inline fours out there. Why? Well, that's what I'm going to try and explain as thoroughly as possible with this detailed video. We're going to explain what the cross plane crankshaft is and how it differs from the flat plane crank. We're going to see how this influences engine balance and how it explains the different soundtrack produced by the Yamaha R1. Then with all of this in mind, we're going to take a look at the history of big bang engines in MotoGP and what benefits they bring to the table in the real world. We're going to end the video by seeing why other brands never adopted the cross plane design in their production bikes and why another fan favorite from Yamaha, the R6 also never got a cross plane crank. So let's get started. As you can see, every single flat plane inline four engine has the same crankshaft. And the key feature that's the same for all of them is that two crank pins point up and two crank pins point down. In other words, two crank pins are 180 degrees apart from the other two crank pins. The result is, of course, that the pistons move in pairs. When two pistons go up, two must come down. This crankshaft is called a flat plane because all the crank pins rest together in a single flat plane. But starting with the 2009 model year, the Yamaha R1 made a radical step away from this convention, which is more than a century old. Instead of having the crank pins 180 degrees separated from each other, the, all the crank pins point each in its own direction. So if we, if we set up the crank, so the crank pin one points up, then crank pin two is going to be 90 degrees away from crank pin one. Crank pin three is going to be 180 degrees away from crank pin two, and crank pin four is going to be 90 degrees away from crank pin three. In other words, one points up, one left, one right, and one down. Why is it called a cross plane crank? Well, if you look at it from the front, from the nose of the crankshaft, or from the end of the crankshaft, you're going to see that because each crank pin points in its own direction, it creates a cross. We have two planes crossing each other at a perpendicular angle, hence cross plane. So why are 99.99% .99 of inline fours out there flat planes? Well, they're flat planes because if one takes a rational, objective approach towards designing an inline four engine, you would see that the flat plane configuration offers more benefits and less drawbacks when compared to a cross plane configuration. And to better understand why this is the case, we must see how the flat plane and the cross plane differ from each other in terms of primary and secondary engine balance. As you may know from my previous engine balance videos, the primary balance refers to the balance of the reciprocating masses in the rotating assembly. So in other words, an unbalanced mass in the rotating assembly would lead to a primary imbalance. For example, the inline three cylinder engine has a primary imbalance because it has an odd number of pistons. The inline four has a perfect primary balance because it has an even number of pistons. Each piston mass can be balanced out by the mass of another equal piston. In a flat plane configuration, two pistons go up, two pistons go down, so it means that piston one and two can balance each other out, and pistons three and four can also balance each other out. A cross plane also has an even number of pistons. The outer two pistons, pistons one and four, are 180 degrees apart from each other, so they can balance each other out. The inner two pistons, pistons two and three, are also 180 degrees apart from each other, so they can also balance each other out. So it's the same thing as with the flat plane, just with different pistons, which means that we should also have a perfect primary balance in the cross plane, right? Wrong. 
Yes, we do have an even number of pistons in the cross plane, but the problem is their relationship with and distance from the engine's center of mass, which means that the cross plane engine has something called a rocking couple. So what is a rocking couple? Well, in simplest terms, it's a pair of forces. They're equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction, and they're displaced from each other by a perpendicular distance. So here we have our two forces, the outer two pistons. These forces are equal in magnitude because the piston mass is the same and the acceleration is the same, so the force is the same. But the forces are opposing in direction. When one piston goes up, the other piston goes down. We can also observe that the pistons have perpendicular distance between them and from the engine's center of mass. So our two pistons are in fact a rocking couple, and the effects of a rocking couple on any mass can easily be observed with any simple object. If you apply equal but opposing forces at the ends of the object, the object will rotate. The flat plane in line 4 has no rocking couple because the forces applied at its ends and at its middle are both equal in direction and equal in magnitude, and thus the flat plane in line 4 is perfectly balanced in relation to its center of mass. But in the cross plane, the rocking couple actually creates a torque about the center of mass of the engine. In other words, as the engine is running, it's actually trying to flip itself over. Obviously, the force of the piston isn't enough to flip over the entire mass of the engine, but it still creates a noticeable vibration that must be engineered out of the engine. You will also notice that in the cross plane engine, cylinders 2 and 3 also create a rocking couple. They're just like cylinders 1 and 4, however, they are closer to the center of mass of the engine, which means that they have less leverage on the engine, which means that their movement doesn't contribute to the vibrations as much as that of cylinders 1 and 4. So how do we get rid of the vibrations associated with the rocking couple? Well, the good news is that this is a primary rocking couple, and primary vibrations occur at the same speed as the speed of the rotation of the crankshaft. And this means that we can add mass somewhere on the crankshaft to counter the forces of the rocking couple. If you observe a typical crankshaft of a muscle car cross-plane V8 engine, which is essentially two banks of cross-plane inline force, you will see that the first and the last counterweights of such a crankshaft have much more beef or mass added to them. They are larger and thicker than the other counterweights uh, of that crankshaft. And this is because mass is added to these counterweights to counter the forces of the rocking couple and thus eliminating the vibrations. Now, this kind of solution is acceptable for a muscle car, but it's really not acceptable for a sports bike like the R1. Because if you add mass onto a crankshaft, you make it more difficult to spin up because the heavier something is, the harder it is to spin up to speed, which reduces is the rev happiness of the engine. So this is obviously unacceptable for a sports bike, which is all about rev happiness. So instead, the Yamaha R1 employs a different solution. It uses a balancing shaft, which rotates at the same speed as the speed of the crankshaft to counter the forces of the rocking couple. Although a balancing shaft does add friction and it saps the power of the engine, it is still a more acceptable solution for a sports bike because it doesn't impact rev happiness like adding weight on the crankshaft wood. Now let's proceed on to secondary balance. Now secondary balance of inline force is a topic that I have pretty much beaten to death in my previous video. So if you need a more step-by-step uh, -step easy to understand explanation or just a reminder, you can find a link to get a timestamp that timestamp in the description because in this video, we're just giving a short, simple explanation of secondary imbalance. Now, in essence, secondary engine imbalances come from the fact that the piston covers more stroke during the first 180 degrees or the top 180 degrees of the crankshaft's rotation than during the bottom 180 degrees of crankshaft's rotation. So if our stroke is 100 millimeters, when the, uh, when the crankshaft rotates from zero to 90, the piston isn't going to cover half the stroke. It's going to cover more than half of the stroke. This occurs because of the connecting rod. The connecting rod has a complex path of motion. When the piston is at TDC and BDC, the connecting rod is fully upright. But when the piston is at around half the stroke or when the crankshaft is at 90 degrees of rotation, the connecting rod sits at an angle. Obviously, an angled connecting rod is shorter than a fully upright connecting rod in relation to the piston and the crankshaft. So when the engine, when the crankshaft rotates from zero to 90 degrees, the connecting rod assumes this angled position and pulls down the piston by an additional distance. 
Obviously, because the piston covers more distance during the first, the top 180 degrees of crankshaft rotation, has to, it has to accelerate more to cover this greater distance. So there's a difference in, acceler in piston acceleration between the top and the bottom half of the stroke, which means that there's a difference in forces between the top and bottom half of the stroke, because obviously force is mass times acceleration. Our mass, our piston is constant, but our acceleration is diff different, which leads to a difference in forces. And obviously this difference in forces is most pronounced when the piston is near top dead center and bottom dead center, when it's about to change direction. And this is the moment when the conrod and the crankshaft and the rest of the engine have to absorb all the forces, the inertial forces of the piston as it rapidly changes direction. And this difference in forces between the top and bottom half of the piston stroke are the source of secondary engine imbalances. For example, an inline two-cylinder engine which has, which has its two crank pins 180 degrees apart from each other is an example of an engine with poor secondary balance. It has poor secondary balance because when one piston is approaching TDC, the other one is approaching BDC, which means that the difference in forces between the top and bottom half of the stroke are made very obvious and apparent in this engine. But if a 180 degrees inline 2 is an example of poor secondary balance, then the flat plane inline 4 is an example of horrible secondary balance because we have four pistons stopping and starting at the same time. When two are approaching top dead center, the other two are approaching bottom dead center. Because the pistons move in pairs, we have doubled the piston mass when compared to an inline 2, which means that double the mass is of course double the force, which is also double the difference in force between the top and bottom half of the stroke, which is double the secondary imbalance. But in a cross-plane inline 4, we don't have this problem. We do not have four pistons stopping and starting at the same time. We do not have them moving in pairs, and we do not have two up, two down. When the first piston is at top dead center approaching TDC, the last piston is approaching BDC, but the middle two pistons will be mid-stroke, which means that at any one time, only two pistons in the cross-plane inline 4 are contributing to secondary imbalances, which in comparison in relation to the entire engine mass isn't really that significant meaning that the cross point in line 4 doesn't really have the secondary balance issues that a flat point does. But there's bad news for this achievement of the cross point in line 4. Although secondary balances occur twice for every engine revolution and primary imbalances occur only once, secondary imbalances are usually much smaller in magnitude. And this is because primary imbalances are a direct result of the unbalanced mass in the rotating assembly, but secondary imbalances occur only to the difference in forces between the top and bottom half of the stroke, and this difference in forces is usually pretty small. But wait, there's more. The cross point inline 4 gets another disadvantage by assuming its non conventional configuration, and the disadvantage is an uneven firing interval. So, as you probably know, in the flat point inline 4, we fire a cylinder, the engine rotates 180 degrees, we fire another cylinder, 180 degrees, another cylinder, and so on and so on. This gives us an even firing interval of 180, 180, 180. So, every 180 degrees of the engine's rotation, we fire a cylinder. But this is not how things happen in the cross plane. Now, as you know, we have four distinct strokes in a four stroke engine intake, compression, power, and exhaust. And here you can see what each cylinder in this cross plane engine is doing at any time. Now let's focus and observe the uneven firing interval. So let's start from this point in time right here, when we fire cylinder two. As you see, when we fire two, three is on the compression stroke, which means that it's next in line to be fired. And as you can see, piston 3 is at the bottom at BDC, which means we need another 180 degrees of engine rotation to be able to get a 3 to TDC and fire that cylinder. So we rotate another 180 degrees and we fire cylinder 3. So which cylinder is next in line to be fired? Obviously number 1 because it's on the compression stroke. But as you can see, this time, this is cylinder 1 only needs 90 degrees to TDC. So we don't have any choice. We rotate only 90 degrees, we get 1 to TDC and we fire 1. Right as we fire cylinder 1, we can see that cylinder 4 is now beginning its compression stroke and it's at BDC, so we rotate again another 180 degrees and then we fire cylinder 4. So as you can see now, we have fired all four cylinders, which means that we have to start this cycle again from the beginning by firing cylinder 2. This is what we started with, but there's a problem. Due to the unique crank pin arrangement, we can observe that at the moment when we fire cylinder 4, there's no other cylinder on the compression stroke. As we said, we should be firing number two next, but number two isn't on the compression stroke. As you can see, it's on the intake stroke, having completed half or the first 90 degrees of the intake stroke. 
This means that we have to rotate 90 degrees to get number two to finish the intake stroke and then another 180 degrees to again get cylinder two to TDC so that we can fire it. So in the end, the firing interval of the cross plane looks like this, 180, 90, 180, 270. This is obviously totally different from the flat plane. And this also explains the different soundtrack of the cross plane. The extended pauses between cylinder firings stack up rapidly as RPMs increase and our ears and our brain perceive the sound as a totally different soundtrack. Don't believe me? Well, there's a channel out there who has done an excellent job of explaining why different engines sound the way they do. Have a listen. So an uneven interval gets you an interesting soundtrack. Well, that's all well and good, but it actually, it's bad for engine balance. It's bad for engine balance because an even firing interval is one of the key prerequisites for a smooth, balanced engine. An uneven firing interval increases engine vibrations, and then you have to combat this by making the engine stiffer and heavier, and ultimately increased vibrations can reduce the engine's power potential. So we have to ask ourselves, why in heaven's name would Yamaha build this engine? It seems that it sacrifices so much to get so little. It sacrifices perfect primary balance, weight and simplicity in order to get better secondary balance, which really isn't that important on a small displacement engine because the piston masses are low, so the difference between the top and bottom half of the stroke uh, forces is also low, and it also gets a distinct soundtrack, but I mean, come on, who would sacrifice all this for a soundtrack and better secondary balance? There must be something else to it. Well, there is, and the deal is that sometimes getting a bunch of disadvantages is worth it if you get one key advantage. And sometimes something that looks like a disadvantage might not be a real disadvantage in the real world. In fact, it might actually be an advantage. So the year is 1992 and the motorcycle is a two-stroke legend of MotoGP, the Honda NSR 500. And in this year it was unveiled with a brand new firing interval that will later get the name Big Bang. So the engine in the NSR 500 is a two-stroke V4 engine, which means that when it has a regular firing interval, a cylinder fires every 90 degrees of crankshaft rotation. But for this year, it was unveiled with an absurdly irregular firing interval. The pistons were made to fire simultaneously in pairs. Two would fire at 68 degrees of rotation and the other two at 292 degrees of crankshaft rotation. So instead of four equally spaced small banks, we get two big banks in pretty quick succession, hence the name Big Bang. This is contrasted to the term Screamer, which describes the soundtrack of the even fire uh, engine. And just like with our modern R1, the uneven firing interval introduced on the NSR 500 increased vibrations and reduced power output, but somehow magically led to reduced lap times. It might seem counterintuitive that a reduced power can result in better lap times, but we must remember something important. MotoGP machines have more power than they can actually use. This is true today, and it was true back in the 90s with the brutally accelerating, mostly analog two-stroke machines, which were difficult to handle for even the most experienced of riders. 
This excessive power is usually most noticeable during corner exit, where in many corners a MotoGP machine cannot apply full power during corner exit, because applying all the power would actually lead to a loss, loss of control, sliding, and actually a slower corner exit. Instead, the rider must carefully judge the amount of throttle applied to exit the corner as fast as possible, to reduce sliding, and to keep the bike at the very ideal limit of traction. This means that for a MotoGP machine, power usability can be more important than the maximum power output. In some cases, power usability can even mean the difference between quickly exiting the corner or ending in a high side like this one. As you can see, this is bad and the rider ends over flying over the handlebars of the motorcycle, which obviously nobody wants. Now, people who watched MotoGP back in the day of the 500cc two strokes will tell you that high sides happened a bit more often before uh, than they do today, mostly due to the analog and brutal nature of the two strokes. But there was a time when actually high sides peaked in MotoGP and were very common. And this happened when the bikes transitioned away from bias ply tires onto radial tires. Now a radial tire is ultimately better, it has more grip and it allowed motorcycles to become a lot faster. But a bias ply tire has an advantage for the rider in the sense that it transitions more gradually from full grip to full sliding. This gradual transition allows the rider to feel the limit of traction approaching and react appropriately. In contrast to this, a radial tire grips like crazy only to suddenly let go. And then it's gonna grip again, but by the time it grips again, it's gonna be too late and it almost always ends in a high side. The problem is that with a radial tire, the transition from full grip to no grip can happen so quickly that human perception simply cannot detect it. By the time the rider senses the limit of grip, it can often be too late. So the newly introduced radial tires, together with the brutal nature of the two-stroke machines, resulted in a very high number of high sides. Although it feels that way, the power delivery, the power output of an engine isn't really a single constant thing. It's a series of short, quick power pulses. So the power from the engine is delivered to the tire via the chain in the form of many little pulses. And Honda decided to manipulate this to enable the bike to be easier control and have better corner exit. So an evenly firing engine looks like this on the tire. These are the individual power pulses as sensed by the tire. But the Big Bang engine looks like this. As you can see, between the large individual pulses, we have a lot of space where the tire is essentially freewheeling. They are, there are no additional power pulses sent to the tire. Now these silent gaps can also be called recovery gaps and they're absolutely critical for the tire because they give the tire time and room to recover and regrip. And this is absolutely key for the rider too, although obviously a human cannot detect a single recovery gap between two engine power pulses, they do stack up and they do create space for the rider at the limit of traction that enables him to better feel the limit of traction. In contrast to this, the even firing Screamer engine isn't really giving the tire any room to breathe, if you will. It subjects the tire to a constant even barrage of power pulses. Obviously this barrage of power pulses is also going to continue when the tire starts to slide even a bit. So it starts to slide a bit, power pulses continue and they simply push the tire further out of control very, very quickly. Now many people also call the Yamaha R1 engine a big bang engine, but it isn't a big bang engine in the real traditional sense of the word. An example of that is the Kawasaki ZX-RR, raced from 2002 to 2008 in the MotoGP. It's also an inline four, but it's, it's constructed to fire two cylinders almost simultaneously and then rotate a lot and then fire the other two cylinders. And as you can see, it's firing interval looks a lot more absurd than the firing interval uh, of the Yamaha R1. And it's miles away from the even firing interval of Screamer engines. So the R1 isn't your real Big Bang engine, but it has the same goal. It has the goal of allowing the rider to better feel the limit of traction. It simply aims to strike a compromise between the absurd vibrations of a true Big Bang and the massive power delivery and efficiency of a real Screamer. 
So if it's so great for better sensing the limit of traction, why did other manufacturers not adopt the crossplane design in their production sports bikes? Well, the reason is that it does require a lot of additional engineering and it does increase the weight and it does increase the cost of the bike. And also because the benefits of the crossplane design are realized at the very limit of the motorcycle, the question is raised about how many regular buyers are actually capable of pushing a bike like the R1 to its very limit. An additional factor is that Yamaha had the most experience and practice with the crossplane design starting in 2002, so of course they had less R&D and less costs involved into putting the motorcycle into mass production. And the limit of traction aside, the very term crossplane and the very distinct soundtrack of the bike helps set it apart from its competitors, which definitely helps sales. So why did R6 never go crossplane? Well, this very question is what journalists asked R1 project lead Mr. Toyoshi Nishida soon after the release of the crossplane uh, R1. Would the R6 get the same technology? Well, Mr. Nishida responded by saying that the R6 really doesn't have the excessive power of the leader bike. And racers in the R6 class usually exit the corner at full throttle. This means that... Uh, the benefits of the crossplane design really wouldn't be realized in the R6 because most of the benefits of the crossplane are realized at part throttle. The leader bike simply can't floor it out of the corner because it has too much power. The R6 doesn't really have that much power to cause it to slide as easily. And on top of that, the added balancing shafts, engine weight and stiffness would simply sap power away from the R6. Hence, it never got the crossplane because it really didn't need it. And there you have it, the inline 4 crossplane engine. At first glance, it's just a heap of disadvantages. But then when you remember it's very specific, focused and extreme application, you get to realize that one of these disadvantages is actually a very important advantage. So yeah, that's pretty much it for today. As always, thanks a lot for watching and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.